this episode of Trial Story. And I was yelling, no, stop. A woman cries rape and the nation listens. The accused, one of the Kennedy clan. I'm confident I'll be found innocent. We're not going to be tried at the newspapers in this case. You'll hear the alleged victim, see what the jury saw, and watch what the jury decides. In this episode of Trial Story, from opening statements to the verdict, accused of rape, the trial of William Kennedy Smith. He raped me. And I thought he was going to kill me. She was a 30-year-old single mother. I'm innocent. And how do you defend yourself from somebody who says the word rape over and over again he was a 30 year old medical student but their chance meeting in a trendy palm beach bar ended up in a criminal case that some say only hollywood could have dreamed up the stars the closest thing america has to a royal family the setting one of america's wealthiest and most elite winter resorts Add to that the accusation of rape and the voracious media coverage, and you get a trial seen by more people than any other in history. I'm not guilty, Your Honor. From the very start at his arraignment, William Kennedy Smith, a nephew of Senator Ted Kennedy, adamantly proclaimed he was wrongly accused. I wanted to, uh, to see the judge and look her in the eye and tell her that I'm not guilty. His accuser wanted to protect her identity. Until the trial ended, her lawyer spoke for her. Mr. Smith knows exactly what happened, and that his lawyer's press release is 100% false. It fell to the jury to decide which one was telling the truth, the accuser or the accused. We find the defendant not guilty. The verdict in December of 1991 is well known. William Kennedy Smith acquitted on all charges of rape. But the trial left a lasting impression on America. It illustrates the difficulties of using the courts to decide a traditionally private matter, a relationship between a man and a woman. It underscores the problems of trying date rape cases, where the defendant and victim know each other, and the problems of any rape case. How do you keep the alleged victim from being unfairly scrutinized and a defendant from being unfairly accused? In this report, you're going to have the chance to see what the jury saw and hear what the jury heard in a case that captivated the nation. When the case came to light, some facts were not in dispute. The victim met William Smith a little bit after midnight, March 30th, at Al Bar. At closing, the alleged victim drove Smith to the Kennedy compound. The couple went down these stairs to the beach. The alleged victim says Smith took off his clothing and decided to go for a swim. She decided to leave. But it's here where the stories start to differ. She says she was about to leave the beach when Smith raped her. Smith never denied that the two had sex, but he says the alleged victim consented to the act. You bet. A media blitz began immediately. Television news reported the latest developments each night. Newspapers around the country headlined the most intimate details of those involved. Breaking a time-honored rule, the alleged victim's name was identified by members of the media. Her background revealed. Feminists clamored around the alleged Second, victim. I think it has a terrible, terrible impact on all the other women who have been raped and have to decide whether to file a complaint. Ultimately, the alleged victim herself chose to reveal her identity after the trial was over. Her name? Patricia Bowman. Meanwhile, well, the Kennedy family circled around the defendant. I know uh, uh, Willie well and love him very much, and I'm uh, sure that uh, when all the facts are known and the results come in, that he'll be uh, vindicated. It was in this atmosphere that the rape trial of William Kennedy Smith began. The trial pitted a 40-year-old, no-nonsense prosecutor, Moral Lash, against high-powered criminal defense lawyer, Roy Black. My client from the beginning has said that he's innocent. He did not rape this woman, period, end of story. He's not going to plea bargain. He's not going to do anything except to contest this case at a trial. Before the trial even began, Black scored a victory. The court denies the state's motion. Judge Mary Lupo had ruled that the jury would not hear the stories of three women who prosecutors say 
William Kennedy Smith had also sexually attacked. May it please the court. Lash began her opening statements claiming Patricia Bowman had no ulterior motive for reporting the alleged crime. Her only motive for reporting this crime was her own belief in our system of justice. She did not report this crime for money. She did not report this crime for publicity. The evidence will demonstrate that the defendant's conduct was not only cruel, violent, and against her will, it was most importantly criminal and against the law in the state of Florida. Prosecutor Lash painted an innocent night out for Bowman, which ended up on the Kennedy estate. The victim, Miss Bowman, agreed to give <coughs> William Smith a ride to the estate. She trusted him. She did not feel she was in any personal danger. Miss Bowman and the defendant chatted for a while on the beach. She states that she kissed him, but she felt there was no sexual overture on the part of the defendant. The defendant told Miss Bowman that he was going to go in for a swim. He took off his shirt and began to take off his pants. She decided that it was time for her to leave. She turned to walk away. She felt slightly uncomfortable at this point. She called out to him, telling him, good night, I'm leaving. The defendant, William Smith, came from behind. He grabbed her leg and pulled her. Lash says Bowman ran, but was tackled by Smith. The defendant pushed up her dress, which was black, pushed aside her underwear, and entered her vagina with his penis. She tried to work her hand down to get his penis out of her vagina. She told him to stop it. She told him no. She did not report the crime immediately because she feared that no one would believe her. This was a famous, prominent person. She was an unknown person. She feared that the town of Palm Beach Police Department would give the Kennedys, a famous family, more consideration than they would give Trisha Bowman. The evidence is going to demonstrate beyond all reasonable doubt that William Kennedy Smith is guilty of the crime with which he has been accused. That on March 30th, 1991, this defendant, William Smith, did commit a sexual battery on Patricia Bowman by inserting his penis into her vagina without her consent. Thank you. It was now the defense's turn. Need a copy. And Roy Black chose to evoke the Kennedy name. I wanted to start out by talking to you a little bit about Ted Kennedy. Why he was at the home that particular weekend. What many people may not know is that there are 21 children the Kennedy family who do not have a father. For those who do not have a father, Ted Kennedy is their surrogate father. On Easter of 1991, it was sort of a difficult time for the Smith family because in August of 1990, Stephen Smith, Will's father, had died. Once again, another widow in the family, another case of children without a father. One reason he was there at Easter was to be with his sister, to be with his nieces and nephews who had lost their father. Lash was not happy with this line of defense and three times protested to the judge that Ted Kennedy's relationship with his family had nothing to do with the evidence. Black then turned to Will Smith's version of the story. We have never in this case denied that there was sexual intercourse between William Smith and the complainant. Let's make that clear. The issue in this case for you to decide is whether or not there was a crime. And you will hear from the testimony that there not only was no crime, but this was a consensual act of sexual intercourse. Black states that it was Bowman's idea to drive Smith home, and once there, a moonlit night sparked a romantic encounter. After making love, or while making love, William Smith ejaculates. The complainant starts to get very upset, 
very angry and very mad. You will hear that she's in the 13th day of her cycle, uh, gets upset at, him, upset at him for doing that, and starts to talk to him about it, and he, according to her, is cold and indifferent to her concern. She had expectations here that were not fulfilled. You will hear as to the conversations that go on. She becomes increasingly mad as things go on, and she runs into the house. One of the key issues in this case is going to be the issue of credibility of truthfulness, of honesty. You have to determine whether or not this allegation is truthful. Ladies and gentlemen, after you hear all the evidence in this case, for the first time, Will Smith is getting a chance to put a defense on. For the first time, we're not going to be tried in the newspapers in this case. For the first time, we get a chance, finally, to explain what happened. And when you hear it, you'll see that this young man is not guilty. Thank you. The jurors heard the opening statements, and in fact, what happens inside this courtroom is all they'll be hearing for the next 10 days. Despite the media circus outside the courtroom, the jurors have been sequestered, shut off from all news of the proceedings. In 1991, in the Tony community of Palm Beach, rape was almost unheard of. In the previous year, only one rape had been reported in this town of 10,000. But March 30, 1991, changed that image. Palm Beach was now the scene of an alleged celebrity rape. My name is Anita F. Hill. And just as the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas hearing had recently sparked debate on the issue of sexual harassment, the William Kennedy Smith trial created a national dialogue on the issue of date rape. If a man and a woman know each other, when does an act of sex become an act of rape? One difficulty prosecutors have is the perception that the woman may have encouraged the assault. It was something Moral Lash had to face even before this trial began in jury selection. I don't think it was very proper for her to be in the situation she was in on that particular morning hour of the day. She shouldn't have done it. In the end, the prosecution and defense agreed on a jury of four women and two men. I do. Moral Ash's first key witness was Ann Mercer, the friend Patricia Bowman called from the Kennedy estate. She had met Smith at Obar that night. And she came up to me and said that she was going to give uh, William a ride home. Did you say anything to her? I said to her, are you going to be okay? What was her demeanor at that time? Uh, having a good time, happy. Did you sense or detect any sexual innuendo in anything that she said to you about giving him a ride home? No. Ann Mercer testified that she went home and at about four in the morning received a phone call from Bowman. Can you describe her demeanor on the phone to you? Hysterical. What did she say to you? That she had been raped. Did she say anything else? She asked me to come uh, pick her up, and I had asked her where she was, and she told me she was at the Kennedy estate. Mercer testifies she arrived at the Kennedy estate in minutes. What was her physical condition when you saw her at that time? Hysterical, very shook up. Was she crying? Yes. How did she act that led you to the conclusion that she was hysterical? What did you see? Uh, her, she was literally shaking and uh, she looked messed up. Her hair and her makeup was running. Did she say anything to you there? She said that she had been raped. She asked me to get her shoes. She kept repeating over and over again about her shoes. Where are my shoes? And uh, to comfort her, I went inside the house to find her shoes. Uh, I went into the kitchen area and I was looking for the shoes. I thought maybe they'd be nearby. And that's when uh, I ran into William. 
Smith. What did you say when you saw him? I said to him, uh, how could you do this to my friend? And what was his response? No response. He just shrugged. The hostile tone and direction of Roy Black's cross-examination began in the very first words between the two. Good afternoon, Miss Mercer. Good afternoon, My sir. name is Roy Black. I represent Mr. Smith. I'm aware of that. Your friend says that she was raped, is that right? Yes. What she tells you is that she wants her shoes. Is that correct? Yes. So you went into the house, is that correct? Yes. Into the house where the rapist is, right? I guess you could say that, yes. You get to a dark stairway, isn't that correct? Yes. There are no lights on that stairway, is there? No. You go down this stairway, right? Right. With this man? Right. You and this man who's the alleged rapist go out the door, is that correct? Right. Out onto the beach? Right. And you then spend uh, several minutes looking for these shoes with this man who's the alleged rapist, is that right? Right. Then after a while you say, well, let's forget about looking for the shoes and let's go back. Right. Is that correct? Right. Going up the stairs, this man who's alleged to be a rapist is behind you in this dark stairway, is that correct? Right. The two of you go up the stairway, isn't that right? Right. Now there's one thing you forgot to tell us in that uh, scenario on direct examination. What you said to this man who's the alleged rapist when you left. You forgot about that, didn't you? I wasn't asked that, sir. Didn't you tell him you were sorry? No, I did not. Oh, didn't you tell him, uh, Miss Mercer, that you were sorry that you had to meet under these circumstances? Uh, I used those words. I didn't yet. ask you why you used them. I said, did you say you were sorry you had met him under those circumstances? I did not mean I was sorry. I didn't ask you what Objection. you meant. She's not being allowed to answer the question. Overruled. Please answer the question. The question is, did you say to this man, I'm sorry we met under these circumstances? Yes, I said that. To the man who's supposedly the rapist, is that right? Yes. The man who raped your friend, right? Yes. Your friend who you say is hysterical, right? Yes. Black next tries to further hurt her credibility by implying she has a motive yes. to lie. Now you've received a total of $40,000 from a current affair? Yes. And you say that the National Enquirer offered you 50000 plus royalties as well, is that right? Yes. And. Uh, I think you even told us other, other tabloids have offered you money, haven't they? Yes. And you and Chuck used the money to go to Mexico for 11 days, didn't you? Right. The following day, Black brings forward a vase taken from the Kennedy home that night and places it in front of the witness. Mercer claimed her boyfriend, Chuck Desiderio, yes. took it that night to yes. prove that they were at the estate. Are you aware that uh, only your fingerprints are found on the urn? Uh, I had read that, and I assume that's because I had given it to the police. But Chuck's fingerprints are not on the earth, are they? That I is mean, very odd to me. Do you have any idea why Chuck's prints uh, were not on the urn? That is very odd to me. I mean, did anybody clean the urn after it was in your house? No. Black questions Mercer about what happened when police asked her if Desiderio was holding anything that night. I was afraid maybe to answer that question, uh, that she may say that we were stealing. Well, my, my question is, Ms. Mercer, when you said I didn't see Chuck holding anything, that wasn't true, was it? That is true. In fact, to be blunt, you were lying, weren't you? I don't like you to say that to me. Throughout the rest of the cross-examination, and for redirect examination by Maura Lash, the vase remained in front of Mercer, a pointed reminder for the jury that the witness participated in a theft, and Mercer was a setback for the prosecution, and there were more setbacks to come. Maura Lash later called Senator Ted Kennedy, who was at the compound on the night of the incident. The conversation was very emotional conversation, a very difficult one. Brought back a lot of uh, very special memories uh, to me, uh, particularly with the loss of Steve, who uh, really was a brother to me and to the other members of the family. And 
I found at the, at the end of that conversation that I was not able to uh, think about uh, sleeping. I opened the door and called for Will and uh, Patrick and they, they answered. And I asked them uh, whether they wanted to go out. We went to Obard's. I wish I'd gone for a long walk on the beach instead, but we, we did go to Obard. Did you hear anything at all that night at the Kennedy estate? No, I did not. Did you hear any screams? No, I did not. Did you hear any noises at all within the house itself? No, I did not. That testimony hurts the state's case more than it helps. Black seizes the moment. He questions Kennedy about William Barry, who was at the estate that night. Does he have a, uh, a special relationship with the family? Very, very special. Uh, in fact, is he not the uh, <coughs> man who knocked the gun out of Sirhan Sirhan's hand? Yes. You mentioned uh, the name Steve Smith. What is Steve Smith's or what was Steve Smith's relationship with uh, Will Smith? Well, Steve uh, Smith's uh, Will's um, father. He was uh, very special to uh, to me. He was an extra brother, really. Uh, we lost a, a brother in the war. When Gene married Steve, we had another brother. And uh, when uh, Steve was gone, uh, something left all of us when we buried him. Ted Kennedy may have been an unexpected score for the defense, but another state witness is not. Kennedy's son, Patrick, testifies about an important element of the state's case inconsistencies about the time events occurred. When you gave your sworn statement on May 1st, 1991, you never indicated to me at that time that you had any doubts about the clock being wrong, did you? No, I didn't. Well, who told you you were wrong on the time? Um, it, my attorney said that there were many people who said that the times were different and that uh, you know, we better think about the fact that the clock might have been wrong. But what I have said to you was truthful. I saw the clock. It read 12 o'clock. Throughout her case, Morrill Ash also called on a series of experts to convince the jury that the physical evidence pointed to rape. Dr. Rebecca Prosko was the emergency room doctor who examined Bowman in the afternoon, the day of the incident. I diagnosed her as having a rib contusion contusion on the right and treated her for that. I feel I could conclude from the time I spent with her um, that she had been through a uh, traumatic event of some sort and that is consistent with her alleged rape claim. And Barbara Carabello, a forensic scientist with the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, yes, testifies are. about examining the clothes Patricia Bowman wore that night, including Bowman's underpants. The inside crotch lining <laughs> contained sperm cells. Uh, semen was present. She also testifies about the condition of Bowman's pantyhose. The pantyhose contained several runs, holes, and tears. And in my opinion, appeared shredded. But on cross-examination, the defense counters with the question about whether the clothes showed signs of a struggle. Can you examine this in your laboratory? Yes, I did. And it was intact? Yes. There was no damage to it? No obvious damage. No tears, holes, or defects were noted on the dress, bra, underwear, short pants, or t-shirt. The defense hoped the jury would think Bowman was lying about the struggle. Love. Meanwhile, the state continued to argue the opposite. Previously, prosecutors had introduced evidence about Bowman's physical state, entering photographs of Bowman's bruises after the alleged attack. Later, Maura Lash puts Dr. David Lottman, Bowman's doctor, on the stand. He testifies that there were bruises and swelling on Bowman's body following the alleged attack. She had complaints of pain uh, behind both shoulders. She had complaints of uh, pain in the ribcage bilaterally. She had complaints of pain in the pelvis bilaterally. Behind the right shoulder blade, basically. Uh, there was a discolored area about the size of a silver dollar. 
in a matching area behind the left shoulder, there was an area of swelling uh, without discoloration. With the injury to her um, that she complained of to you in her uh, chest area be consistent with a rib contusion? Yes, a rib contusion or a bruise. Yes. Defense attorney Mark Seid encounters during cross-examination. Doctor, would it surprise you to learn that uh, on January the 22nd, 1988, she made the exact same complaint to another physician in Orlando, Florida, that it hurt her to breathe and move? It, it would be news to me, yes. And uh, she's made other complaints on other times of uh, difficulty moving and breathing, hasn't she, or pain and breathing? Moving and breathing? I'm not sure about the moving, but there was in one of those records a reference to the breathing, yes. Despite the pointed cross-examination, Moral Lash's case has not been put to the real test. That won't happen until she calls Patricia Bowman, one of the two people who was really there in the early morning hours of March 30, 1991. Do you think you can decide? It was clear during jury selection in the trial of William Kennedy Smith that the Kennedy name still had magic. I've always uh, been very fond of the Kennedy reputation of the Kennedy name. The inauguration of John F. Kennedy as President of the United States sparked America's fascination with the large, close-knit Boston family. The nation saw them as its own aristocracy and hungrily followed every detail of their lives. The shining moments and the heartbreaking tragedies. In the best of times, the name meant glamour, energetic youth, and selfless public service. But for some, it also came to mean undue influence and power, a Kennedy machine that might have allowed a cover-up at Chappaquiddick. The 1991 Easter weekend plummeted a little-known Kennedy, William Smith, into the limelight. In the days following the alleged rape, the family came out in full force, fiercely sticking to his side, just as America had come to know the Kennedys would. I'm very uh, happy to be here with my sister. Gene. William has the same kind of loyalty from his cousins, 30 of which uh, meant most of them are coming down here to stay with him. That loyalty was taught by our parents. But there was another perception of the Kennedy mystique. When you hear the name Kennedy, what goes through your mind? Controversy. They said he was a Kennedy, he'll probably get off. In the end, the defense apparently decided the Kennedy connection would work in its favor. And each day, a cast of aunts, cousins, and siblings lined the row behind William Smith. And they were there when Maura Lash calls her most important witness. Please state your full name for the record, Patricia Joyce Bowman. Now, Patricia Bowman faces William Kennedy Smith for the first time in court. Bowman, on the morning of March 30th, 1991, did you meet an individual by the name of William Kennedy Smith? Yes, I did. Do you see that individual in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. Could you point to him and indicate where he's seated today? He is standing right there. Where did you meet the defendant, William Smith, on March 30th, 1991? At a, at O-Bar. And I had turned the corner around a, a columnar type area and bumped into, in, into him. Bowman testifies they danced, and when she found out he was a medical student, she talked to him about her young daughter, who had a history of medical problems. I, I really felt like I could trust him. Um, he he was a, seemed to be an intelligent man, a likable man. Um, we were carrying on a conversation that had, to me, no fearful attitudes. Ms. Bowman, are you ab able to remember every detail of what happened on the morning of March 30th, 1991? No. Why aren't you able to remember what happened? Because I was raped. Did you feel that you were in any personal danger in giving him a ride home? Um, he had done nothing suggestive to me. Um, it just seemed like we were talking on a friendly basis. I was taking him to the Kennedy at home, which I, I assumed would have security. Um, there was a senator there. Did you say anything to him to indicate that you wanted to have sex with him? I did not want to have sex with him. And, and I said no such things. That he asked me if I'd like to come in and see the house. What did you say? I thought about it and, and, and I decided that yes, I would like to come in and see the house. She says she and Smith went down to the beach where they kissed. Did he ever indicate to you that he felt by kissing 
him that you had to have sex with him. No, he seemed more interested in going for a swim. Okay, what did you do? Um, when he started taking off his shirt, I, I realized he was probably going to go swimming. And when he started to take to work on 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 the tab part of his pants, um, I, I got a little concerned. Uh, he hadn't been this way the entire night, and um, I turned my back. I didn't think that was appropriate. I started up the stairs and was at the top of the steps, and my leg was grabbed. I couldn't figure out why my leg had been grabbed. And, 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 and Mr. Smith had been such a nice guy, and I thought, well, maybe he thinks this is playing. I broke my neck years ago, and I can't play that way. What happened? He tackled me. And I was on the ground, and he was on top of me. I was trying to get out from underneath of him because he was crushing me. And he had my arm him. And, and I was yelling, no, and then stop. And I tried to arch my back to get him off of me. And he slammed me back into the ground. And I got, and, and, and then he, he pushed my, my dress up. And he, he raped me. And I thought he was going to kill me. I was telling him to stop. I was screaming no. And I was struggling. And he told me to stop it, bitch. Did you feel this was an act of love? Oh, God, no. It's an act of violence. Did his... He insert his penis into your vagina. Yes. Was that done against your will and without your consent? Yes. Did he ejaculate? Yes. What happened after he ejaculated? <coughs> the pressure on me seemed to lighten. And I got out and I ran. And um, I ran towards the house. Bowman testifies. She hid in the pantry and called Ann Mercer. Why didn't you call the police? I was in the Kennedy home. All I knew is I wanted to feel safe. I wanted somebody to come and help me feel safe. And I didn't know that the police would care or would come. She says she managed to stop shaking enough to get herself out of her hiding place. I was getting a little bit better. And, um, And then he grabbed me again. Who grabbed you? He did. Did you say anything to him? Yeah, I, um, I said, and I don't know why I said the name. I said, Michael, you raped me and, and leave me alone. And um, he was, like, pulling on me, on my arm, and he had my other arm. And um, he took me into another room, and I was telling him, you raped me. How could you do that? And he was just sitting there very smug, and um, he said, I didn't rape you. I said, you raped me. You know you raped me. Why did you rape me? You don't need to rape me. You could have gotten any of those women if you wanted sex. You didn't need to rape me. And and he said, I didn't rape you. And I said that I called my friends and that we were going to call the police. And he said, well, you shouldn't have done that. Nobody's going to believe you. Bowman left the house, and she says her friends Chuck Desiderio and Ann Mercer arrived. Mercer went into the house to look for Bowman's shoes. Chuck was trying to calm me down. And then I realized that Annie um, was in that house, and he was in that house. And I got real scared that he would, um, he'd, he'd hurt Annie. And I was yelling at Chuck to go get Annie out of that house. I she says she went back into the house and saw framed photographs on a table. And I thought, if I take a photograph, then, then that'll prove 
that I was here. Lash then takes the opportunity to bring up a key issue she knows the defense will hammer on. Do you have any recollection of how your pantyhose came up? No. Do you recall how your shoes came off or when? I don't have a clear recollection of, of, of my shoes coming off. She testifies that she went to Mercer's house and then went home and called a rape hotline. She agreed to meet the rape counselor at the sheriff's office. How did you feel at that point in time about reporting this crime? I, I, was, I was too terrified of him, um, his, his family's power. I, di I didn't know, you know, all I knew was, was that I needed some help. I knew I'd been raped. Have you been offered money in exchange for interviews in connection with this case? There were offers coming in all the time, and I refused all of them. Did you have any ulterior motive for reporting the crime that took place on March 30th? I reported what he did to me because it was wrong, because I have a civic duty to do so. Bowman's testimony is compelling and moments convincing. Smith reacts defensively outside the courtroom. Obviously, we saw some very uh, sad and some very dramatic testimony today. Um, but I've been living with these allegations, with this damnable lie, for the last eight months. And I hope everybody will be patient, as I have been, and allow me the opportunity, with Roy's help, to defend myself in the coming days. Thank you very much. It's now the defense's chance to cross-examine her. Roy Black must walk a fine line. He doesn't want to appear to be the cold and different lawyer defending a brutal rapist. Yet he wants to highlight contradictions and holes in her story. Black starts out with what will turn out to be one of the key pieces of evidence. Did you have your pantyhose on when you drove your car from Obar? Yes. Did you have your pantyhose on when you got to the parking lot at the Kennedy home? Yes. Did you have your pantyhose on when you got out of your car? I'm not sure. Did you have your pantyhose on when you went into the house? I'm not sure. Did you have them on while you were standing on the beach? I don't remember. Isn't it uh, true, Miss uh, Bowman, that you took your pantyhose off in the car? No, I don't remember. You told us yesterday that you weren't invited to go on the beach until you were in the kitchen, right? Yes. So you didn't take the pantyhose off in the car because you thought you were going on the beach? I don't know when I took the pantyhose off. Well, it had to be for some other reason that you took them off. I don't know. The pantyhose and the shoes were later found in the car. Black is implying Bowman took them off to have sex with Smith. Now, you told us uh, yesterday that you have uh, problems uh, remembering details. Is that correct? I don't remember if I said that or not. I have memory lapses regarding that night because I've been raped. Okay. Well, let me ask you... Uh, some of, the th some of the other things that you said in your statements, you were able to describe what you had to eat. Yes, I remember what I had to eat. And you were able to describe to them that you had one glass of Chianti there? Yes. You didn't have any problems remembering those details? Those were not traumatic events. Now, you were able to describe uh, Ted Kennedy, were you not? Uh, here I have, yes. And this is 12 hours after uh, you say you were raped? Uh, I was raped. Now, yesterday, uh, you told us that um, Will assaulted you on the lawn. He raped me. That's what you said yesterday, is that right? Yes, sir. Now, during this uh, event, was he able, at least according to your testimony, able to maintain an erection? to ask me questions well, would like you like that? To, to have a recess, Ms. Bowman? I need to ask you some questions about this. You want to request that we have a recess? No, I will get through this. This has been a nightmare for me. I want this over. You know, I request that we have a recess. It's a 20-minute break. We'll resume at um, 10.30. After the break, defense attorney Roy Black resumes questioning her about the alleged rape. You said that your right arm was pinned down. 
has been between us. You said that uh, his chest was on your chest holding you down, correct? Yes. Okay. You say that he was at the same time pulling up your dress? Oh, uh, he was pushing my dress up. And then he was able to push your panties aside? May I take it you mean by pushing the crotch to the side? I, I don't know how he did it. He just, he did it. At the same time, he was able to enter you while unable to obtain an erection? I don't... All I know is he had me down, he pushed my dress up, he pushed my panties aside and raped me. Ms. Bowman, when you hit the ground, as you described it, were you, did you go face into the ground or did you land on your back? I don't know. I just know that he hit me and and then he was on top of me and my, and my back was on the ground. Right. Did you hit the ground very hard? I don't know. All I know is he hit, hit me from behind and then he was on top of me. You don't know how hard it was? It was hard. Black turns to the clothes Bowman wore that night. When you left Ann's house, you were still wearing the same panties, weren't you? Yes, sir. And when you drove home, you still had the same panties on? Yes, sir. And when you got to your house, uh, you stayed there for uh, several hours without removing those panties. I, I'm not quite sure how long I was at my house. You, know, you, you felt dirty, you felt awful, and what have you, you kept those same panties on. Was I, I right couldn't this, think this to... I, I didn't know what to think. The man had, had raped me, and I was just concerned for myself. Miss Bowman, I, I know I, I have not stopped you from saying that each time, but I'm just asking you if you could please answer my okay, question. Okay, I'm sorry. Black once again asked Bowman about the details of the incident. Did you make any kind of movements with your hips to uh, prevent entry? I, I just was trying to str struggle and get away from him. I don't know if it was with my hips or not. So you, you were struggling. You were trying to prevent uh, the act from occurring. Yes. And you try as hard as you could to prevent it. Yes. Would it be fair to say then that you put up a fight? I tried as hard as I could. I take it then from your testimony, and correct me if I'm wrong, at the time that this happened, you were not in any way sexually aroused. So you were not, by what I mean, by not lubricating or any kind of physical matters like that. No. Okay. You said, uh, uh, Michael, you raped me. I can't get calm. Get away from me. Leave me alone. I don't know. I, I just remember trying to get out and, and, and him grabbing me and saying, Michael, you raped me. And uh, you were calling him by this name, Michael? Yes, sir. You had gone through a, a very, just recently gone through a very difficult time in your life, had you not? Yes. And uh, where uh, you had a difficult time with your daughter's father? I had a difficult time losing my daughter's twin. Yes, I mean, you're having this very difficult time and uh, this man ends up leaving you, does he not? Oh no, Johnny had, um, Johnny had no idea that I was pregnant. You mentioned, uh, Ms. Bowman, in, in the statement that you, know, you had a lot of anger about men because of this incident with Mr. Butler. And you're exhibiting anger against men, though, are you not? I've been raped. And you're talking about your anger and why you cannot trust men. And that's because of this uh, relationship that you had with Johnny Butler, isn't that correct? No, but my answer, I felt, was more implied or more towards I'm not capable of having a one-night stand or, or a casual relationship, sexual relationship with a man because I'm a parent, because of what I've been through with Mr. Butler. And there were no uh, contraceptives used that night? Were there? No. Thank you. I have nothing else wrong. It was a devastating cross-examination, one that was hard to recover from. But Prosecutor Mora Lash returns for a blow-by-blow -blow rebuttal, ending with a final question. Do you have any ulterior motive for going through this, Ms. Bellman? Yes. What is that? Objection, Your Honor, to the motivations. Probably. 
What he did to me was wrong. I have a child. What he did to me was wrong. And it's not right. And I don't want to live the rest of my life in fear of that man. And I don't want to be responsible for him doing it to somebody else. I object, Your Honor. I'd ask to approach. Patricia Bowman's final words were stricken from the record. She leaves the stand, hoping that despite inconsistencies pointed out by the defense, her story will stick in the minds of the jurors. I know I'm the one who's been charged, and I'm the one who's on trial. But it's difficult sometimes not to feel in some, that my family's on trial for me, and in some strange way, I'm on trial for my family. From the moment word got out that a woman had accused a Kennedy of rape, the media went into full swing. No detail was left unreported, no moment left untelevised. All of this is constitutional, but could it, as the defense claims, jeopardize William Kennedy Smith's right to a fair trial? Could six unbiased jurors be found to decide Smith's fate? Smith's attorney argued that the press made it impossible, and Judge Mary Lupo postponed the trial for three months in hopes that the attention to the trial would decrease. It didn't. The trial only increased the media and public's appetite. As the defense starts its case, it tries to counter some of the expert testimony introduced by prosecutors. The defense calls a sound expert to testify about how sound travels at the Kennedy compound. Uh, if the windows were open, in given circumstances, noise would, would come into the house uh, fairly easily from fairly long distances. The point? Those inside the house would have heard Bowman's screams. But more lash counters on cross-examination. Did you conduct any tests for sounds or acoustical properties while you were there? No, no technical tests. And your basic statement about sound carrying is based upon observations, not testing, correct? That's correct. And you the defense moves on to call its own forensic expert to testify about Patricia Bowman's clothes. The video examination of this garment is sort of uh, good to excellent condition. No obvious damage can be seen. But that testimony is challenged by the prosecution. What we have here, Dr. Lee, is a handkerchief which demonstrates the theory of transfer. Yes, ma'am. And what we have here is a dress worn by Patricia Bowman, which you said has no stains on it. That's correct. Well, you didn't, you didn't perform anything on the dress. No, I did not. And in reality, these two things don't relate at all, do they? That's correct. The defense also introduces another forensics expert who testifies about sand he detected in Bowman's dress. Do you have an opinion within a reasonable degree of scientific certainty if there's any way that the sand from Q10 and Q11 could have come from the lawn at the rear of the Kennedy home? Uh, yes, I don't, I don't see uh, any way that uh, samples Q10 and Q11 could have come from that lawn. That could give credence to the defense claim that the couple had consensual sex on the beach. Lash tries to counter that argument. Assume that the defendant, when he got out of the water on March 30th, 1991, and was wet, began to run up the beach towards the stairs. And assume that there was some wind blowing outside at the time. Wouldn't you agree, doctor, that a six foot two, 200 pound man running up a beach is gonna churn up some sand? Yes. And assume that the defendant took down a woman, Patricia Bowman, on the east lawn of the Kennedy State at that time and raped her. Some of the sand from his body could be transferred onto Pitts Bowman, couldn't it? Um, it depends on where he made contact and what part of the person you're talking about. Well, say he couldn't get his penis in her at first and he used his hand to manipulate her body. If he had hand, sand on his hand, that could get on his Bowman, couldn't it? I guess so, yes. A gynecologist is called to testify that a man with a partially erect penis would have trouble raping a struggling woman. It's like a trying to put a thread through a needle, trying to put a thread through a needle. Uh, even, you know, I'm sure it's common experience, we wet the end a little bit and twist it to make it firmer, to try and get it through that small opening. And I think in a way that's a, a very difficult. And then if you add to that the fact that that needle is uh, jiggling around, if you will, 
are using that as sort of a way to conceptualize what happens, it is very, very difficult. What the defense has hoped is that expert testimony like this will cast doubt on the story Bowman told on the stand. But the most important witness is still ahead. On the ninth day of the trial, Roy Black called William Kennedy Smith. For the first time, he tells his story of what happened on March 30th, 1991. Smith tells of his uncle, Senator Ted Kennedy, inviting his cousin Patrick and himself out for a late night drink at O Bar. I was waiting for the bartender <coughs> to serve me. He was serving a fellow next to me and trying to make eye contact with him. And I felt somebody brushing against me on the other side. And I turned and, uh, and Patty was standing there. I asked her if I could uh, uh, buy her a drink, and she said yes, and I bought her a drink. Uh, I asked her if she wanted to dance, and she said uh, yes. You say you've been kissing on the dance floor. What were you feeling at that time? Um, I was feeling that uh, I'd gotten, uh, that I was getting, that I'd gotten picked up. Did you, were you attracted to Patty? Uh, yes, I was. Was she attracted to you, as far as you could tell? Yes. After you've been, uh, been dancing, what happens then? Well, I remember the bar being clear. I remember the lights came up. Um, and, uh, I saw the Senator and Patrick leaving. And I turned, well, yeah, I turned to Patty, and uh, uh, and I said, uh, there goes my ride. What did she say when you said that to her? She said, I, I, I'll give you a ride. And when we got back to the house, um, I kissed her, and I asked her again if she wanted to go swimming. And she said, yeah. And I said, okay. And I started to get out of the car, and um, and she said, give me a minute. And I closed the car door and I stood in the parking lot. That provides the defense's explanation for where Bowman's pantyhose were removed. Smith then testifies about their conversation that night. My recollection is she said my grandfather was head of a, of a tire company. And he did some terrible things. And he was a terrible person. And you might do anything to get away. You might change your name. You might do all sorts of things. Do you know what I'm talking about? What'd you say? I said, I have no idea. Did the conversation continue? Um, she said to me, I wouldn't expect you to, Michael. What was your response to that? I stopped and I, uh, I I think she called me Michael a second time and was looking at me and I said, my name's not Michael. So what did she say in response to that? She said, uh, let me see your ID. <coughs> so what did you do? So I said, okay, I didn't, I mean, I thought maybe she had me confused with a cousin or, I, I wasn't, in any event, I took out my wallet and I gave her my ID. And what did she do with it? Um, she looked at it. And she said, oh. What, what sense did you make of, of that conversation? I, I had n really no idea. I thought at the time that this was, I don't know, I thought she had me confused or with someone or she was disoriented or I don't know. I went over to her and I kissed her again. And um, we started walking across the lawn, arm in arm, down to the beach. <coughs> what, what, what were you thinking at this time as to what was going to occur? Um, I thought that we were going to have sex, and uh, I walked over to her, and we kissed, and I put the towel down in the sand, and we got uh, on the towel, and... What happened to on neck. the towel? We started to neck. Well, she unbuttoned uh, my pants, and uh, I took her panties off, and uh, with her help, and... Um, and uh, we embraced, and I uh, could 
feel her, I put my hands on her, and uh, she was uh, excited, and um, I asked her if she had any birth control. What was her response? She said, we better be careful. She sort of sat up, and I rolled off to the side, and she put her hands on me. Where did she put her hands? She put her hands on my penis. And what did she do? She massaged me. And what were you doing at this time? Uh, I was kissing her. And so what happened? Um, I, uh, I ejaculated. <clears throat> After uh, you ejaculate, what occurs between the two of you? Um, I sat up and I asked her um, again if she wanted to go in swimming. And she said, you go ahead. Did you swim? Yes, I did. And did you ever look back at the beach? Yes, I did look back at the beach, and I could see that Patty wasn't on the beach. He says he found Bowman near the house and told her he was going to bed. She started uh, uh, pulling playfully at my towel, and uh, we started kissing, and um, we put the towel down on the lawn, and... Uh, she took off her panties and uh, uh, and she we were necking for a while and she was massaging me and uh, uh, I wasn't excited um, and she put me inside of her and we started to she said to be careful and we started to Make, have sex. After a while, we were moving together on the lawn, and I got more excited, and uh, uh, and I thought I was maybe gonna ejaculate inside of her. And, uh, so what happened? Well, I held her uh, very tightly, and I I stopped moving, and I told her to uh, s stop it, and I called her Kathy. Well, the minute I said it. I knew that it was a mistake. Smith has now established uh, his explanation I, for Bowman's rape charge. She sort of, uh, she sort of snapped. In what way? She got very, very upset, and she told me to get the hell off of her. And what did she do? And she hit me with her hand. And then what happened? And I rolled off of her, and she got up and, and uh, marched off, and I called after her, Patty. Smith testifies he then goes for a swim in the pool. He says he finds Bowman back at the house, where they agree it's time for her to go home. I said to her, try not to worry about what happened back there, because I was pretty careful. What did she say? She said, you're the one who better worry. You raped me, Michael. What was your response to that? Um, I stopped dead where I was, and I said, who's Michael? And she said, I've called the police. And I said, I hope you're kidding, Patty. And she s just kept walking. And, um, and I said, and now you're leaving? And she said, yes. And she got into her car, and she backed up, and she started to drive down the parking lot. What happened as she was driving out of the parking lot? She stopped about halfway down the parking lot. What'd you do? I walked down to where her car was, and I, she rolled down her window, and I looked down and I said, and, uh, what's going on? And she said, I'm sorry I got upset. I had a wonderful night. Uh, you're a terrific guy. And I returned the compliments and we chatted by the window. And she said to me, um, what's your phone number? What'd you say? I said, uh, I don't know. Um, I'm just down here for a couple days, and I don't know my phone number, and I'm leaving in a couple of days. What was her response? She said, um, tell it to Kathy. And then what she And do? she drove away. According to Smith, Bowman then returns to the estate and wanted to talk. And she started building up steam, and, um, and then she said, and you don't 
uh, you could have had any person in the place. And, um, and she started shaking and crying, and she said, and you don't even want me. And um, Michael raped me. What was your response to that? <coughs> I said, who's Michael? And what did she say? She said, you showed me an ID that said Michael on it. So what then did you do? I, s I said, that that's ridiculous, Patty. I said, look, and I stood up and I got very frustrated and I said, I took out my ID and I showed it to her and I pointed at it and I said, look, it says William Smith, William Smith, William Smith. I said it three times. Will that, uh that night, that early morning, that Saturday morning, did you at any time forcibly rape Patricia Bowman? No, I did not. Thank you. William Smith testified for just 45 minutes on direct. His story seemed a convincing one. He painted Patricia Bowman as an unbalanced, angry woman bent on revenge, and it presented a problem for the prosecution. This is the first time that Smith has ever revealed his version of what happened that night, and prosecutor Lash is left to cross-examine the defendant without the benefit of any prior statements. You left so. a few things out of your story, didn't you, Mr. Smith? I, d I don't know what you're talking about. Why don't about. you explain to us how Patty Bowman sustained a contusion to her rib on the morning of March 30th, 1991? Slash, I don't know how or if Patty Bowman sustained a contusion. All I can tell you what happened when she was with me and I can tell you that she did not get a contusion when she was with me. Well do you consider this story that you've told to the jury today to describe an act of love? It's not a story it's the truth. Okay. Do you consider this to be an act of love? Is that how you describe what happened? I know that Roy Black used the words act of love those weren't my words. Okay. Roy don't... isn't isn't an old-fashioned guy and that's his way of talking about okay. things. Well, I think probably that I would have picked different words. I would have said, had sex. Didn't you carry through with your threat, Mr. Smith, and do everything you could to make sure nobody would believe her? Miss Lash, I don't, I've searched myself every night since March 29th to try to find out why Patty would make an allegation against me that's not true, that's going to destroy my family, destroy my career, possibly send me for, to jail for 15 years. I don't know why she would do that. I don't understand why anyone would do that. I understand Patty Bowman has a lot of problems. I am, she talked about her neck. She talked about her child. But that's not the issue here. The issue here is I'm innocent. And how do you defend yourself from somebody who says the word rape over and over again? And when you ask them what they're talking about, all they say is, I, my ch should they talk about my child or my neck or... Okay, well, so that's, that's the situation I'm you in. You brought up her and neck. I, and I'd like okay. you to tell me how to deal with it. So you're saying that in the time she met you at Obar, which couldn't have been any earlier than 2 o'clock in the morning, until the time it closed at 3 o'clock, which is about an hour, that she was just overcome by your animal magnetism and wanted to go home and have sex with you. <laughs> I don't know what was going on in Patty's mind. And it's your testimony that you had consensual sex with someone that you just met and you didn't use any protection at all? Yes, it was a uh, um, foolish and irresponsible thing to do. Patricia Bowman has had a child. In fact, she stated she would be a high-risk pregnancy if she had another child. Yes, what she did was a very foolish and irresponsible thing. How did she consent um, to sex with you. What did she do that led you to believe she consented? Well, uh, I would have to say that it was a lot of different things. Uh, I can tell you that she uh, put my, me inside of her uh, when we were on the lawn 
Um, I can tell you that I was not quite ready and that she helped me inside of her. Now she's not only rubbed against you and asked you if she could take you home, now she's actually the person who puts your penis in her vagina. That's correct. Okay. What are you saying, that she raped you, Mr. Smith? Absolutely not. Are you saying that after ejaculating on the beach, you can now go up on the lawn and ejaculate a second time? What I'm, sa what I'm saying, I guess, is that I did not climax a second time. Uh, did I did have my penis inside of her, um, and uh, there was semen found inside of her. Okay. But I honestly thought that I had pulled out and I did not have an orgasm, if that's helpful. When Patricia Bowman turned to leave and go up the stairs and leave the Kennedy estate, your ego could take that rejection, could it? That is absolutely not true. You had decided that you were going to have sex and it really didn't matter what she wanted at that point, did it? Slash, that's absolutely not true. Mr. Smith, in your mind, when did Patricia Bowman lose her right to say no to sex with you? Patricia Bowman, Patty Bowman, never lost her right to say sex, to say no to sex with me. She didn't Any time she could have said no. When she did say, get off of me, that's exactly what I did. Thank you, I don't have any other questions. Under cross-examination for four hours, William Kennedy Smith remains adamant at times, wrestling control of the cross-examination away from the prosecutor. Smith has furthered his own case, helping to shed doubt on Patricia Bowman's story. It's day 10 in the trial of William Smith. And then you will retire to deliberate. The, the jury has heard both sides present their evidence. Now it's time for closing arguments. For Maura Lash, the trial has not gone well. She now makes a final effort to convince the jury that William Kennedy Smith is guilty of rape. What you heard during the course of this trial was not an act of love. It was not an act of sex. It was an act of violence. Rape is an act of violence, an act of humiliation, an act of degradation. One woman has come forward to tell the truth. She has demonstrated extraordinary courage to be willing to put herself through what she has had to endure to come forward and to ask that her rights as a victim be vindicated under the law of the state of Florida. Her faith in the court system and her belief that she's doing the right thing <clears throat> has motivated her to pursue a criminal prosecution. No matter who the defendant is, all people are equal in the eyes of the law. There is no aristocracy or no class that is above the law. There is absolutely <coughs> no reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of exactly what he is accused of. On March 30, 1991, he raped Patricia Bowman. He is guilty of sexual battery. On March 30, 1991, he grabbed Patricia Bowman. He is guilty of battery. Through competent, incredible, and scientific evidence, the state of Florida has proved every material element of these crimes to this jury. Thank you. Roy Black now has his chance to counter all of Lash's arguments. We said right from the beginning that this charge was untrue. Her statements do not fit the evidence. The evidence that we know is true, evidence that can't be fake, evidence that can't lie, evidence that can't be made up, evidence that can't be speculated the things the hard physical facts and evidence that's that that's there the inference is that you have to find them guilty because otherwise you're going to say he's a member of the kennedy family and that's why he got off and you can't find somebody guilty because of the family he comes from i know that you're good and honest people and that you're going to honestly look at the facts of this case and follow the law and i know when, when you do that you'll see that the only proper verdict under our law is not guilty the prosecution comes back for a rebuttal first of all if someone was going to make 
an allegation of rape and it was a false allegation wouldn't the person say he was a monster his penis was erect and make it all fit together nice and neat into a, a story of someone who was purely evil what you have here is a, a crime with a mental aspect it's the crime of a very intelligent person and you can see the, the aspects of it and it may have worked with other women at Obar it just didn't work with Patricia Bowman she said no and the defendant violated her rights under the law of Florida thank you it's been eight months since Patricia Bowman first alleged she was raped. You may now retire to consider your verdict. It is now up to the jury to decide if the evidence supports the charges. If convicted, William Kennedy Smith would have faced up to four and a half years in prison. It takes the jury just 77 minutes to reach its verdict. William Smith and his family returned to the courthouse from their unexpectedly short vigil at the Kennedy estate. It's clear they believe the quick verdict means acquittal. Members of the jury, we've been informed that you've arrived at a decision. Mr. Stearns, I see you with a paper. Are you the foreman of the jury? Yes, ma'am. Would you hand that paper, please, to Mr. Grossman? The verdict is in order. The clerk may publish the verdict. Excuse me, Mrs. Allen, I forgot to give my warning instructions. I apologize. I'm not used to um, working uh, in a group where I have to concern myself with this. I should have said this when I came out before you jurors <coughs> arrived. There will be no public expression from anyone in this room upon the pronouncement of this verdict. Should there be anyone here family members of the alleged victim, family members of the defendant or anyone else, members of the media who feel that he or she cannot control himself or herself, please leave now because if I hear one response, meaning no applause, no boos, no cheering, no response, if I hear one response from anyone in this room, after the courtroom is cleared and the jury leaves, there will be hearings, as many as necessary, citing anyone who violates this order with direct criminal contempt, and we will proceed with, accordingly with those proceedings. So feel free to leave right now if you need to. Mrs. Allen, you may publish the verdict. In the Circuit Court of the 15th Judicial Circuit Criminal Division in and for Palm Beach County, Florida, case number 915482CFAO2, State of Florida versus William Kennedy Smith, we the jury find as follows, as to count one, we find the defendant not guilty, as to count two, we find the defendant not guilty. So say we all this 11th day of December, 1991. Excuse me, Mr. Black. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Go ahead. So say so we all this 11th day of December 1991 in West Palm Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida. Thomas Stearns, Jerry Forper. Mr. S Smith, could you please stand with your attorneys? The jury having found you not guilty of count one sexual battery and not guilty of count two battery, I hereby enter an order adjudicating you not guilty and I will sign a judgment of acquittal as soon as Mrs. Allen prepares it for me. You may be seated. You are released from all responsibility concerning the case and your cash bond is discharged. I'd like to say Merry Christmas to everybody who's watching. Um, they say that um, gratitude is the memory of the heart. And I have enough memories in my heart to last a lifetime. I have an enormous debt to the, to the system, uh, to God, and I have a terrific faith in both of them. And I'm just really, really happy. 
So see you guys later. <laughs> One juror reported that although the jurors found Patricia Bowman's testimony touching, the evidence on the whole did not convince them, beyond a reasonable doubt, that her story was true. That juror pointed specifically to Bowman's memory lapses, to the lack of damage to her clothes, and to the absence of serious injuries. Ultimately, what this trial came down to is credibility. The credibility of the accused and of the accuser. For they are the only eyewitnesses. For Court TV, I'm Cynthia McFadden.